Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story of Emily. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now, Emily, with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Is it possible for some men to love an inanimate object more than they could ever love a human being? This is the story of Emily, the life story of a violin. Let us go back to the little Italian village of Cremona. The year is 1732. In his workshop, Antonio Stradivarius, maker of fine violins, is fingering with loving care a beautiful new violin. Francesco, come here, please. Yes, Father. It is done, see? Oh, it is your greatest creation, Father. Yes, 12 years of loving labor here in this one violin. But every moment was well spent. My son, we have created an instrument that... that is almost a human. Our tears, our laughter... Yes, our very souls have gone into the aging of the wood. Our hands have lovingly carved the fingerboard. Our hearts, the sound post. Let me play it, Father. Please do, Francesco. Let it sing its first song just for us. It sounds like the voice of a beautiful girl, rich, full, vibrant. But one not yet tempered by the years, my son. Today, this violin sings the song of youth. But as it lives... It will cry also. To be perfect, it must suffer as human beings suffer. It must drink deeply of life to be able to sing of life. Father, what shall you name it? I've been thinking for many months about a name. You know, my son, there is only one name that I think we can give it. It is the name of a young girl that I once heard singing in the hills of Lombardy. I was but a boy. It was a spring, the hills were green, the blossoms bursting on the fruit trees. As I walked over the hills of our Lombardy, I thought I heard the voice of an angel. It was so fresh, eager, so full of life. There was sheer joy of youth. Bashful as I was, I, I spoke to her. You have the voice of an angel, signorina. Well, thank you, young man. Oh, no, do not thank me, signorina. Thank the good God in heaven for the miracle of your voice. I thank him for more than that, my young friend. 
I thank him for being alive, for letting me see the wonder of his miracles, for spring in our beloved Lombardy, and for giving me the grace to follow him as a nun. A, a nun? You? Yes. You see, my young friend, tomorrow I enter the convent of Mata Dorlesa. It is my calling. I am to be the bride of the Savior. God has doubly blessed you, Signorina. You are fortunate. I only ask that I can always feel as I do this morning, and that I may serve my Creator and sing His praises. What, uh, what is your name, Signorina? Emily. But why do you ask? Because someday I shall create a violin that will be better than all those in the world, better than even those made by Amati. And when I do... Then, when you have created this great violin, my little friend? I shall name it after you, Signorina. I shall call it Emily. <laughs> And so, in 1732, the maker of the world's finest violins inscribed into his greatest creation these words. Emily, Antonio Stradivarius, Cremona, 1732. In the next 20 years, Emily became the most beloved possession of the great concertmaster, Gustavo Martinelli. Emily was growing, growing in tonal quality and in loveliness. Her muted voice was heard in all the great concert halls of Rome, Berlin, Vienna. She was acclaimed by the music lovers of Europe. And then, one day, the great maestro retired. The golden voice of Emily was stilled, but not for long. Fortunately, a roving band of gypsies came to town. And when they left, under the cover of darkness, they had Emily. <laughs> These were glorious days for Emily, and from the enchanted woodlands of Italy, she traveled north through the Balkans, up through the forests of Russia, ever singing, ever living, ever growing. At night under the moon, the gypsies would gather round their campfires and sing their ancient songs of Romany. Emily pulsed with warmth and feeling. She must have loved the gypsies, and they loved her. For almost 30 years, she traveled from the steppes of Russia to the sunny provincial towns of Spain. One day, the little gypsy band entered Vienna. As was their custom, they wandered through the city singing songs, telling fortunes, and of course, playing Emily. As they played their wild gypsy music, a man opened his window in the olden house and looked down into the street. Well, they're gypsies. Who gives a Paganini competition? Who owns that violin? It belongs to us, Maestro Paganini. To us, the gypsies of Romany. I want to look at it. Bring it up, please, to Sweet 200. But we are not allowed to enter the public buildings, Maestro. We are gypsies. It is against the law. Well, <laughs> when a Paganini says to enter, you enter. With a violin such as you have, you can storm the very gates of paradise. Come in, I say. <laughs> oh, come in, gypsy girl. Come in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maestro Paganini. Hey, but where are the others? I invited them all. Oh, they will wait for me outside. <laughs> we gypsies are not worthy of the invitation of the great maestro. Ah, uh, you gypsies. <laughs> what the simple children you are. You cry and laugh. <laughs> Much as the children do. <sighs> but I envy you. I, Maestro Paganini... Envy you with my whole heart. Envy us gypsies? Oh, you might start making fun. No, no, no. No, I speak what is in my heart. 
I envy you, Gypsies, because you alone know the wonderment of nature. You alone witness the miracles of God. And you alone have the feel of life. Oh, <laughs> give me the violin, please. I, I would look at it. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is, Maestro. Oh. <laughs> Let us walk over here to the window. The light is much better. The work on the ship is superb. Oh, wait. Wait, let me look inside. There. I see the signature. I knew when I heard the tone I was not mistaken. Antonio Stradivarius. 1732. Emily. 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 So this is the violin that the whole world has been searching for. This is Emily, it's the greatest of all creations. Emily? Emily, I, I do not understand. This is the one violin Stradivarius named after a girl. They say she was his boy with a sweetheart before she came a nun. He never forgot. I didn't name his violin after her. And to think it belongs to us, the gypsies. Ah, but my so Paganini. Emily has been happy with us. She sings just as we do and cries, and she dances our gypsy dances, just as though she was born one of us. May I play it? Oh, my so that would make all of us happy. Emily played by the great Paganini. <laughs> Divine. I, I cannot live without. I offer one thousand lira. A thousand lira? Oh, no, maestro. Two thousand three? No, maestro Paganini. Oh, no. Oh, how much then? Name of the price. How much to make Emily mine? I must have. You shall not leave this room until we strike a bargain. Gypsies are strange people, maestro. My father instructed me to tell you that if you love the violin, then it is to be yours. For what the price, Gypsy girl? The price is this. That you shall play one of our beloved songs of Rome and me for us now. Look, look at the window. You see? They stand on the street below, waiting for you to play. Yes. There they stand. All of them. Looking up here. You see now, Gypsy girl, why? What I meant when I said you, you gypsies were God's most beloved children. If, if I cry a little, pay no attention. I'm a silly, sentimental fool. You gypsies are below. You shall have your song of Romany and more. You shall have the eternal love of the great Paganini. I vow you this before the blessed mother. Emily in just a moment. But first, a brief message from your announcer.
And now back to Emily with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Having acquired Emily, Niccolo Paganini soon became the toast of king and beggar. London, Paris gave him their adulations reserved only for the very great. The capitals of Europe begged for his appearance. The years passed swiftly. Finally, he gave his last concert. It was in the Imperial Conservatory in Vienna, just a stone's throw from where he had first heard Emily. arose and applauded his genius, Niccolo Paganini raised his hand for silence. My dear friends, it's hard to say goodbye, but to every man that time has come. For me, it is tonight. You who have loved me these many years have not forgotten the fact that my hands have played upon the most beautiful most wonderful of all violins. I go, but Emily must live on for as long as the world lives on. It is only right that I give Emily to the one I think will make her the happiest. And that man is not very far away. In fact, he's here in this conservatory. I, Niccolo Paganini, to hereby will and convey my violin, Emily, to her Adolf Heller, concert master of the Austrian Imperial Opera. And may he bring joy and happiness, not only to all of you, but to my dearest possession, my Emily. <laughs> Music lovers the world over flocked to Vienna to hear Concertmaster Heller and Emily. Under his talented figures, a new world was opened to her. In the midst of this thrilling period, Herr Heller received a note from Johann Strauss asking him to come to his apartment and to bring Emily. He called on him the following afternoon. Herr Heller, come in, please. I am so happy to see you again. I am honored, Johann. And see, I have brought Emily... As you asked me to. Good, good. Oh, that is wonderful. Now I know I will succeed. Here, sit down, please, Herr Heller, Adolf, and let me tell you what I've been doing. Thank you. Adolf, you and I have been born and raised in Vienna. Beautiful Vienna. Is it not so? Oh, yeah, Johann. Our Vienna is the most beautiful in the world. Music and Vienna. The one belongs to the other. That is right, Adolf. Now, let me tell you. For the past few weeks, I have been working on a new composition that will make our Vienna live forever in song. I have the manuscript ready, but I wanted Emily and you and I to be the first to play it. Then we will see whether or not it is really as beautiful as I hope it to be. Now, come over here, to the piano, Adolf. Yes, you are. See, here is my composition. I have called it Blue Danube. If you will play it for me, I shall accompany you on the piano. It will be a great honor, Johann, for both Emily and for me. As long as a single one of us remains alive, Emily will never leave Vienna. Never. It is my solemn vow. From father to son, father to son, down through the next three generations, 
Emily stayed in the Heller family as each son became, in turn, concertmaster of the Royal Opera House. These were exciting years. <laughs> But all good things must come to an eventual end, even for Emily. In 1938, Hitler decreed that Austria and Germany would henceforth be one. By special decree, the Viennese Symphony Orchestra was transferred to Munich. All through the war years that followed, Emily was forced to play music selected by government agencies. It was a time of great sorrow for musicians and for Emily. Then, early one morning, on the outskirts of Munich, there came the sound of war. Munich was about to be captured by the Americans. The city was entered. The opera house deserted. Hey, Yank! Try that building! What? Why, well, there's no one in here. Nothing but a lot of music contraptions, horns, and <laughs> gosh, even a fiddle. Can't be much good, though. It looks too old. Yeah, it looks like one of them antiques. Probably a piece of junk. Gosh, it still plays, though. I'll just take it home. Huh? Make me a good souvenir, even though it does sound lousy. <laughs> Then to America came Emily, and the stage was set for us to meet. I was driving through the hill country of Tennessee. It was a beautiful spring morning. The fruit trees were bursting with their snow-tinted fragrance. Just outside the little village of Pineboro, I noticed some public announcements nailed on a tree. The letters were red and flaming. Barn dance, I read. Hear George Ricketts play his captured German fiddle. Come one, come all. Refreshments. <laughs> Well, I decided to stay over and hear George Ricketts play his fiddle. Well, let's climb, your partners. Swing them around, the race to the left, and twist to the right, and march them down the center of the system, and make them smile. After the dance, I had the pleasure of meeting Emily, and later, talking over a little business matter with ex-GI George Ricketts. It's been mighty nice, Mr. O'Connell, having you as a sort of guest star tonight. And believe me, George, I thoroughly enjoyed my stay over to hear you play your violin. Well, well thank you, Mr. O'Connell. I, I don't play very much, mostly if our square dances and the barn dances in the fall. George, may I look at your violin, please? Why, sure. <laughs> it ain't very fancy looking. In fact, I picked it up over in Germany, a sort of a war souvenir. Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, it does look rather old, doesn't it? Hmm. Don't see how it hangs together after the beating I give it at these here shindigs. You see, George, the man who made it put his name in it. Here it is. See it? Why, sure. I've seen that before. Uh, Anto... Uh, Antonio... Str uh, Str oh, something or other. Never paid me much attention to it. Sounded like some uh, Italian to me. He was, George. He was an Italian. His name was Antonio Stradivarius. He was a great genius, George. I want to ask you something man to man. Why, you just go right ahead, Mr. O'Connell. I'm a listening. Once upon a time, this violin belonged to some musician who undoubtedly loved it more than anything else in the world. Love a fiddle that much? <laughs> Why, you're a Josh. <laughs> no, I'm not, George. I'm telling you the truth. You know, in Europe, these violins are handed down from father to son, down through the years. Well, do they think that much of them? They do, George. I know that someone misses this violin more than, well, more than you'd miss, say, five thousand dollars. Five thousand? <coughs> someone choked me up there. I, I, I'd sure miss five thousand dollars more than I miss that. <laughs> well, then, George, how about it? I'll give you my check for five thousand dollars, and you give me this violin. Well, I say that. That would buy super deluxe instruments for a whole band. Yes, a whole band. 
Why, sure, sure, it's a deal, Mr. O'Connell. But uh, what do you say you write out that check right now? Believe it or not, George, that's just what I'm going to do. <laughs> and uh, what are you going to do with that fiddle, Mr. O'Connell? Keep it as a war souvenir? No, George. I'm going to try very hard to find its owner. And when I do, I'm going to send it back to him. After months of correspondence with friends in Europe, I finally located and sent Emily back to its owner in Vienna. Weeks later, I received a letter from Siegfried Heller, Kapellmeister of the Vienna Opera House. I'd like to read it to you. My dear Mr. O'Connell, Emily arrived at the airport this morning, and now I live again. Oh, the heartbreaking years since I lost her. It was like losing your mother, father, and wife all at once. But now... She's back. Already I've played many of the pieces Emily loved so well. She became warm, throbbing, almost a living human being in my hands. As long as there is a single son to bear our name, Emily will remain with us to play for the world. She belongs not to us, but to posterity. I know, too, that Antonio Stradivarius and the original Emily, wherever they may be, thank you and bless you. I beg to remain sincerely grateful, Siegfried Heller, Kapellmeister, Vienna Opera House. Warren William will be back to tell you the rest of the story about Emily, but first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. There isn't really much more to say about Emily, except that I hope she'll go on and on playing the music of great masters, bringing happiness and love to a sorry world. We need more Emilys, more Emilys to bring us all a little closer together, north, east, south, west, in a real true brotherhood of man. And what is a better way than through the universal language of music? I don't know. Do you? Next week, I have a thriller for you. An innocent man was sentenced to death for murder. One hour before the scheduled electrocution was to take place, a dying woman made her last will and in it confessed that she had murdered the man. Sixty seconds were left to save the life of an innocent man. Sixty seconds. But unfortunately, nature conspired against him. We call this most exciting story, Margin for Love. This is Warren William, inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crepine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Ladies and gentlemen, it might interest you to know that the violin used on this program was made in Italy in the year 1750 by January Scagliano. It was played by its owner, concertmaster Marshal Sasson. Names, places, and events in the program have all been changed so that reflection can fall on no persons living or dead. This is a Teloways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs>